So welcome to the second half of the 2022 uh, Labor Studies Seminar Series. This is the first one for the, the second semester. Um, thanks for joining us. It is really a hybrid event with people here um, at Rhodes University attending in person, and of course, all of you in the, in the audience. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Mike Rogan, um, and this Labor Studies Seminar Series, for those who don't know, uh, is a partnership uh, between several departments at Rhodes University and the Frederick Ebert Stifting, FES South Africa, to whom we are very grateful for their partnership in, in, in uh, supporting this, this seminar series, as well as our uh, various uh, workers events throughout the year. Uh, the departments at Rhodes that are involved are the Department of Sociology and in Industrial Sociology, uh, the Department of Economics and Economic History, and the Department uh, of History. And you'll have, if you followed the series for a while now, you'll have seen that uh, um, we have speakers from all of those disciplines uh, presenting at this uh, seminar series. Um, today, uh, we're welcoming Dr. Risha Kara, um, uh, who we know very well. Uh, Risha was a postdoctoral fellow at the Neil Agate Labor Studies Unit prior to taking on her current post uh, at the Institute for Social and Economic Research. Uh, Risha is joining us today from Botswana, so a huge thanks to her for making the time to, to present her work. Uh, in many ways, this is long overdue. Uh, Risha's postdoc uh, happened right in the middle of the COVID pandemic, uh, where we lost some momentum on our seminar series as we were all staying at home and uh, not interacting with one another during that period. Um, so we're very pleased that she's she's finally getting a chance to present her, her research to her, her colleagues and to all of you. Um, just a short word uh, about uh, Risha's topic. She'll no doubt explain it in much greater detail. Uh, but research, uh, Risha's work builds on a long tradition in South Africa of understanding households and, and household formation. Um, anthropologists, sociologists, and economists have been interested in this topic uh, uh, for at least the past 40 years, if not longer. And if you think about some of the key features of, of apartheid and post-apartheid society, we we can think immediately of labor migration and how this impacted on the formation of households and the way families adapted to the, the constraints and pressures that, um, that the structures of our, of our country's history have, have placed on them. Uh, she's in, in very good company with uh, uh, scholars across South Africa that are interested in households and their formation. And I think she brings a particularly uh, fresh and timely perspective on trying to understand contemporary households in South Africa and across the post-apartheid period. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to uh, hearing what you say, uh, have to say, Risha. Um, as we've mentioned, our format is about uh, 30, 40 minutes of presentation time, followed by um, question and answer uh, uh, period and, and some discussion. Um, so over to you, Dr. Kara. Cool. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Um, welcome, Mike, and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Also, thank you to Nelson for inviting me to speak this afternoon. So as Mike mentioned, my presentation today um, focuses on providing an analysis of non-marital fertility in South Africa over a period of 12 years, um, which is based on selected findings from my PhD thesis, as Mike has also mentioned, um, that I have put together in the form of a manuscript for publication. So the thesis in general analyzed um, this topic in significantly more detail, um, using various sources of nationally representative data sets and focused on different um, sample groups. And I'm, of course, um, happy and open to chat about this more later um, in the presentation or after the presentation. So just before I start, I'm going to stop my video and get going. Okay. So what do I mean by non-marital fertility? <clears throat> so it is a concept used to refer to women who have had a birth outside of a marriage and reported that they have never been married. The concept is very similar to single motherhood. However, the key difference is that these women are not divorced, widowed, or in a legal partnership like a civil union, but rather they have simply never been married. In some cases, these women could be cohabiting 
which is also referred to as a domestic partnership. However, this type of partnering is not illegally recognized as a form of union under South African law, even though it is becoming a more common form of coupling in the country. So this distinction in who is identified as being never married is important to note as it assists in identifying the sample, but more so it contributes to the context of never married motherhood and understanding the various emotional and financial factors amongst others that are linked to having a child outside of a legal union. So an important aspect of South African marriage law is the recognition of customary marriages, which are traditional African marriages and exclude Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, and other religious rights. A large part of a customary marriage is the payment of labola. Um, so to explain very, very briefly, labola refers to the payment of bride wealth, which is a marriage custom central to African marriage. The bola is paid by the intended groom to the bride's nuclear and extended family in the form of livestock, mainly cattle, um, cash and material items like blankets and other gifts. So the relevance of this customary marriage practice in modern society has, elicit, has elicited sorry, opposing views. On the one hand, scholars maintain that the practice is linked to the identity of the prospective bride and groom and their family as it represents the forging of deeper and longer lasting relations, and thus it remains a valued characteristic of African marriage. Whilst on the other hand, scholars argue that the economic transfer between um, the groom and the bride's father represents the sale of a woman and is repressive in nature. So given these differing views on the symbolism of the practice, the current high cost of lobola has been identified as an integral factor in the decline in marriage rates in the country. So this is relevant because the practice of lobola makes capturing marriage data very tricky as the process of lobola payment is very fluid. Uncertainty arises as to when exactly a person is married. Is it when the labola payment has started, um, maybe when it is completed or when the traditional or white wedding takes place. So in light of these challenges in identifying and capturing marriage data, South Africa is reported to have exceptionally low levels of marriage in general and amongst women of childbearing ages. So for example, um, Data from 2016 showed that only 36% of women aged 15 to 49 were married. For the, furthermore, official um, birth, death, marriage and divorce records show that there was a 22% uh, decline in registered civil marriages between 2011 and 2019. And now given the restrictions to movement and activity during the COVID lockdown period, there was a further decline of 31% um, between 2019 and 2020. So a similar pattern was also noted amongst customary marriages or the registration of customary marriages, which um, saw a decrease of 45% between 2011 and 2019, and then a further 43% um, decline between 2019 and 2020. So overall, we see that there are various data sources which corroborate declining marriage rates in the country. Um, so studies from the global North and South have reported an increase in delayed marriage, a decline in marriage rates, and an overall increase in the number of births to women outside of a marriage, outside of a marriage, right? And additionally, a wide range of empirical studies have noted spatial differences in the levels of non-marital fertility, fertility globally. So some of these findings show that, for example, in 2019, 40% of all births in the United States were to unmarried women. In 2012, 40% of all births in the European Union were to, un, were to unmarried women. Now, between 2010 and 2015, we see that 15% of all births 
in Guinea and Togo, and then 40% of all births in Liberia were to unmarried women. Um, there were results or data that also showed that in 2015, 13.8 so 14% of all births in Rwanda were to were to non-marital, sorry, were non-marital, compared to below 5% of births in Ethiopia. Further examples um, from the African continent show that between 1990 and 2015, births to unmarried women increased to 10% in Malawi, 25% in Zambia and Mozambique, and 60% in Namibia. So these figures conclude that globally, there has been an increase in non-marital fertility, um, which is certainly characterized by spatial differences. Um, so various factors have been linked to the increase in levels of non-marital non fertility in the global North and South. And some of these factors include um, increased cohabitation, um, changes in the way non-marital fertility is viewed in society, um, where it has become more common and more acceptable, an increase in educated and employed women who are now a part of the labor force, um, ch changing gendered roles where women are no longer seen as solely being homemakers and caregivers, and um, delayed marriage where, and this is a factor that has been noted in recent South African statistics, where um, the median age for grooms in 2020 was 37 years old, and the median age for brides in 2020 was 33 years old. So given these societal factors, I mean, sorry, given these social factors, of interest to the study are the economic factors that are linked to the increase in non-marital fertility. An overall consensus from the literature shows that economic factors are found to influence marriage in two ways. In the first instance, economic instability has been linked to delayed marriage and or a decrease in marriage rates as couples postpone marriage until they become financially stable. Whilst in the second instance, never married mothers are likely to have low levels of education and be of a lower socioeconomic status, even though education and employment are found to positively influence levels of non-marital childbearing. So there is minimal early research on non-marital fertility in South Africa, as one of the main and what sorry, and one of the main reasons for this is because the collection of empirical data from all South Africans was limited during the apartheid era, um, especially in the early to mid 1900s, so towards the end of the apartheid era. Studies that were conducted had focused on black fertility, which was a point of interest um, as it was linked to population, con sorry, population control of the black majority. Additional studies um, looked at the impact of culture and the sociopolitical climate of apartheid on black women and childbearing. So some of these studies were very meticulous um, and they, they were very meticulously detailed in that they provided um, ethnographic accounts of non-marital fertility among black women in specific South African townships and cities. Um, so the first empirical account of non-marital fertility in South Africa was recorded in 1959 in a small township in Johannesburg. And this um, study was only, was representative of only black women. Um, subsequent estimations of non-marital fertility in the country approximated that in 1960, 5% of all births in the country were to unmarried women. Um, which then increased to 27% in 1989. So post-1994, so post-apartheid, estimations of um, 
national levels of non-marital fertility remain scanned with data from specific demographic surveillance sites um, from a specific demographic surveillance site in Mpumalanga, revealing that between 1992 and 1997, 47% of all births to women aged 12 to 27 took place outside of a marriage. Later results from the same demographic surveillance site showed that between 1993 and 2012, 45% of women aged 10 to 35 had non-marital births, births. So although nowhere close to being nationally representative, these data points highlight the extent of the literature on non-marital fertility amongst all women aged 15 to 49 in South Africa. Current literature on non-marital fertility primarily focuses or primarily focused on a teenage pregnancy and um, childbearing among young women. Moreover, a lot of these studies are based on the analysis of qualitative data. And even in cases where non-marital fertility um, provides empirical findings, uh, these estimates are either not nationally representative or the sample does not include all women um, age 15 to 49. So all women of childbearing ages. So these are the salient factors which then underscored the need for the study, which on my page. So in order to fill the gap in the existing literature, the study aims to provide a national overview of non-marital fertility by firstly identifying whether there has been an increase in non-marital fertility among all women aged 15 to 49 um, between 2008 and 2017. And secondly, by identifying the determinants of non-marital fertility amongst mothers aged 15 to 49. So drawing from the literature reviewed, the study hypothesizes that similar to countries in the global north, there are economic factors which influence non-marital fertility in South Africa. And if this is in fact the case, then it is expected that the regression estimates will highlight that being unemployed, having minimal education, or um, living in a low income household are characteristics of women who will have a child or who will most likely have a child outside of, of a marriage. The analysis is conducted on five rounds of data from the National Income Dynamics Study, which is South Africa's first and only nationally representative household panel study. The information gained from the first wave of the study serves as a benchmark to measure the country's progress and the effectiveness of the policies and programs in promoting positive um, social mobility. So NITS collects information on a variety of themes which include um, health, income, expenditure, um, household consumption, education, migration, mortality, um, and social capital, just to name a few. However, Specific to this study, NIDS also collects a detailed birth roster from, from every woman aged 15 and older. So now this birth roster outlines information on each child's date of birth. So each child, firstly, each child that was ever born to a lady, um, and then each child's date of birth, um, their survival status, um, their living arrangement, and their birth order including other um, variables like their name um, and age and, um, and variables like that. So as a result, um, we can see that NIDS is well suited to a study on fertility as it contains detailed fertility information, which is coupled with the socioeconomic and demographic details of the mother. So um, with the NID study, data is collected um, every two years at an individual and a household level. 
um, with the base wave, wave having been collected in 2008. Um, so although this is a panel study, the data um, is used as time series for the purposes of, of the study. So the sample, the sample consists of two, group of two groups of women. The first group are never married mothers aged 15 to 49. And the second group of women are never married mothers aged 30 and older who had at least one birth after the age of 29. So I will refer to them as older mothers. So the interest in the second group of mothers is linked to studies which have found that women aged 30 and older are more likely to be never married mothers. So based on this literature, an additional focus of the study is to identify whether older women are disproportionately contributing to the increase in non-marital fertility in South Africa. So in both cases, never married mothers are identified firstly by using the never married response category as captured in the NIDS um, marital status variable. Secondly, women who, are, women who responded yes to the question, have you ever been married? I mean, sorry, have you ever given birth? Are then identified as mothers. So for the second group in particular, a dummy variable was used to identify mothers who had, who had had at least one birth after the age of um, 29. And then lastly, the analysis is inclusive of only biological children, as information on children who have been adopted or are being fostered um, is not collected by men. So for this paper, um, there were two methods of analysis that were employed. In the first instance, a trend analysis was produced to identify whether there has been an increase in non-marital fertility between 2008 and 2017. So here, this was um, a bit of bivariate analysis, which looked at the percentage of all women aged 15 to 49 who had a birth outside of marriage. Um, between 2008 and 2017. So this analysis is then followed by a multivariate logistic regression estimation, which identified characteristics that are closely linked to being a never married mother. So the determinants of being a never married mother. And for the regression estimation, the dependent variable was being a never married. So a host of independent variables were regressed against the dependent variable. And these variables are grouped into the following five categories. So the first category is demographic characteristics, which um, include age and race. Second category, spatial characteristics, which include geographic location and province. Um, the category of economic, uh, socioeconomic characteristics include highest education level, employment status, um, and per capita total monthly household income. The fourth category focused on household characteristics, um, and these were household size and gender of the household head. And then the last category looked at personal attributes, and this was um, mother's tertiary education, religious affiliation, and the importance of religious activities. So however, of particular interest to, to this study are the socioeconomic variables and its effect on the, on the dependent variables, on the dependent variables. Okay, so all of the data are weighted, which makes it possible for the estimates to be nationally representative. Um, the period of analysis is nine years, which spans from 2008 until 2017. Um, so this um, also forms the main limitation of the study as nine years is a relatively short time 
to investigate fertility behavior change. However, as I have mentioned, um, earlier post-apartheid South African household data does not include a combination of fertility and socioeconomic variables, um, which are required for a socioeconomic study on fertility. Additionally, um, fertility data on all South African women pre-democracy is, is not available. Um, so now given this limitation, the general household survey could have possibly been used as an alternative, as an alternate data source. However, um, as I have mentioned, I had analyzed um, this data and included it in my thesis, but it was found to underestimate motherhood in the country. So, um, but I do have this analysis available if anyone would like to have a look at it. Okay, so now for the much awaited results. So firstly, to answer the question of whether there has been an increase in non-marital fertility in South Africa, I present uh, figure one, which outlines the trends in non-marital fertility among all women or mothers aged 15 to 49. So the blue trend line shows the proportion of births that took place outside of a marriage among all mothers aged 15 to 49. So the results clearly show an increase in non-marital fertility with a statistically significant increase of 29% between 2008 and 2017. So, and as I did mention, this is seen in the blue trend line. So now that we have established that there has been a significant increase in non-marital fertility in South Africa, over the nine year period of analysis. The second part of the question focuses on identifying whether older women are disproportionately contributing to this increase in non-marital fertility in the country. So if we look at the orange trend line, um, it shows us the proportion of births that took place outside of a marriage amongst older mothers. So these, as I said, said these women are age 30 and older who had at least one birth after the age of 29. So the trend line shows an increase, a clear increase in births to older never married mothers. However, this increase is not statistically significant. So overall, this finding suggests that there has been an increase in non-marital fertility in South Africa over the study period. Um, and that the increase is not driven by older mothers. So against these findings, the next set of analysis identifies the characteristics that are closely linked to being a never married mother um, in South Africa. So, um, as discussed, the, a multivariate logistic regression was estimated where each category of explanatory variables was modeled to control for and identify its effect on the, on the dependent variable. So the five categories of explanatory variables that were discussed in the earliest um, were discussed in the earlier slides, but as a recap, they are the demographic, spatial, socioeconomic, household characteristics and personal attributes. Um, and then also age and gender were used as restrictions in the analysis to ensure the focus on women age on women and um, those aged 15 to 49. So for this presentation, I will focus on specific findings. However, the complete set of results are available in the manuscript. After controlling for these various characteristics, employment status emerged as a significant predictor of non-marital fertility, where women who are unemployed or economically inactive are significantly less likely to be never married mothers compared to employed mothers. So this was definitely an interesting finding and it suggests that employment is somewhat linked to never married motherhood. 
A significant and negative relationship is also found between per capita total monthly household income and being a never married mother and suggests that being a never married mother is associated with a lower household income. The next two findings that I will discuss are the effects of um, education level and gender of the household head on being a never married mother. So interestingly, after controlling for the various variables, um, education level was found to be a non-significant predictor of having a child outside of a marriage. So this is an important finding, which I will discuss in a moment. However, it implies that a woman's education level does not influence whether she will have a birth outside of the marriage. And the last finding that I will focus on is the gender of the household head, which emerged as a strong and significant predictor of non-marital fertility, even after controls were added to the estimation. So the results show that women living in male-headed households were, are less likely to be never married mothers compared to women living in female-headed households. So these are the main results, but now what do they mean and why are they important? So firstly, using empirical evidence, the results confirm that there has been a national increase in non-marital fertility between 2008 and 2017. So prior to the study, these national estimates on births outside of a marriage were not available for all women aged 15 to 49 in the country. The findings also contribute empirical evidence to the study of fertility trends in South Africa and begin to address the gap in the literature by unpacking the dynamics of non-marital fertility within a South African context. So one of the main findings of the study is the significant relationship between never married motherhood, low household income and being in employment. It alludes to the notion that never married mothers are likely to be employed in low paying jobs across in low paying jobs as, as across all of the regression models. Education remained a non-significant predictor of being a never married mother. So this characteristic, interestingly, has been well documented in um, South African labor market literature. And it shows that although the feminization of the labor force has been a key feature of post-apartheid South Africa. Female employment, um, as compared to male employment, is more likely to be characterized by low wage and unstable working conditions. Furthermore, these findings correspond fairly closely with studies from various European countries and the United States and provides firsthand evidence to support the hypothesis that non-marital fertility in South Africa is linked to socioeconomic factors. The relationship between um, the gender of the household head and the significant likelihood of having a birth outside of a marriage is of concern as levels of female headship steadily increase in the country. So this throws into the spotlight the link between non-marital fertility and economic disadvantage. As recent data has shown us that despite factors like, for example, um, the growth in the female labor force participation or and the expansion of the social grant system, poverty differentials by household headship persist in South Africa, where female-headed households are found to be at a higher and growing risk of experiencing poverty compared to male-headed households. So the last point of importance that I'm going to discuss is education being a non-significant determinant of non-marital fertility. Firstly, this finding is in contrast with various South African, American, and European literature, which identified education as a determinant of non-marital fertility. 
So here the underlying notion is that as women become more educated, employed and absorbed into the labor force, they actively decide to have a child outside of marriage. However, the evidence from the study is in direct contrast with this notion and could possibly imply that non-marital fertility may be linked to wider societal and cultural factors. Drawing from the body of literature, which details the effects of apartheid policy on um, family and household structure, Mike spoke a little bit about this in the introduction. These findings then create a platform um, to engage with the notion that non-marital fertility in South Africa could be a result of um, apartheid policies, which negatively influenced marriage between black couples and altered black family structure and fertility behavior. The effects of these policies continue to be inherent in South African society and takes away from the proposal that having a child outside of a marriage is linked to female empowerment and upliftment. So to conclude, I want to mention that these results are compelling. However, I acknowledge that they need to be probed further and possibly with different methodologies. However, the importance and relevance um, remain. Against the backdrop of an increase in births to unmarried women and various literatures which suggest that in some countries, the reversal of this pattern of non-marital childbearing is unlikely. The identification of a socioeconomic determinant to non-marital fertility is of concern, especially within a South African context. Additionally, many children born to unmarried mothers flourish in life. However, recent um, research has also shown that children born to unmarried mothers compared to children born to married mothers often face various difficulties in childhood, adolescence, and um, which extends to their adult life. So these children find it difficult to escape the cycle of poverty, have access to limited resources, which are required for early childhood development. Um, they experience less stable family unions and face multiple psychosocial, educational, and cognitive behavioral changes. So these realities underscore a lot of what we see in South Africa and further underscore the need for additional research on this topic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Risha. You couldn't hear that, but we're all clapping. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks. I would accept that. Door. That's the way these hybrid things go. We miss things like that. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, we can see a few people know how to use the clapping icon. So that's great. Yeah, fascinating uh, presentation. I'm sure there'll be um, plenty of, of questions. Um, let's go straight to it. I think we've got about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, uh, for questions or comments before we we need to wrap up. Um, I've got people in the room, but um, I've also got the list of participants. So feel free to raise a virtual hand or Prof Mbatt has got his actual hand in the air, which I'm able to see. Um, so let's go to Prof Mbatt first. Um, are you okay taking questions in sort of several batches, Risha? Yes, that's most preferred. Mike. Okay. Great. Uh, in Shlanchla. Oh, um, the great presentation, Risha. Really, really enjoyed this presentation the second time around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you, Paul. <laughs> yes. Um, I must also say that um, maybe it's all also because I've had. Uh, uh, just uh, been exposed to a few stats now on not necessarily on non-marital beds, but on uh, decisions to get married, um, you know, uh, by, by gender, by different genders. And I actually uh, saw a stat in the States that says um, 
only about 54% of men actually have kids. Um, and yeah, so that got me, and, and, and more and more um, people are not um, getting married. Um, so, so I think that's one of the reasons why this is interesting. And, and then at the end, you actually answered my question, which I had, that there was a difference between um, the trend of non-marital births in South Africa compared to what we would expect around education. So I was puzzled at the beginning when I saw that because I thought that we would expect that more modern women would make the decision um, just not to get married and then be able to have kids outside of marriage. Um, technically, I'm wondering about the, the population and your sample itself. I also had a question around why did you choose the year 2008 to, to 2017, then I remember the NITS data set um, may have been a, a reason. Um, but then I also wondered whether this uh, sample, does it increase over time? Are there more uh, people in the sample who are female and at the age that you're looking at, how did you sort of like control you know, whether or not it's the population that's increasing as opposed to the actual non-marital birth, if, if, if that was done and how. So I think going forward, I would just be interested in, maybe it's not in this data set, but in the status of the fathers of these children, you know, the, and, and also more sort of like probing around decisions around marriage itself. And yeah, like I say, the socioeconomic status of the man. Thank you. Very, very uh, fascinating. I really, really like uh, the study. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Uh, great questions, indeed. Um, any other hands? Um, I've done something funny to my screen, so I'm less likely to see your hand if you're raising it. Um, but I don't see any. At the moment, um, Risha, do you mind if I add a question on to um, on to that? Um, I also am uh, familiar with this research, so that's a slightly unfair advantage. Um, but I, you know, I guess for me, the the thing that we've always spoken about that's quite striking is that we would see such an increase over such a short period of time, right? You know, we had every reason to expect that that particular eight year, nine year period where um, uh, where we had a, a data that could be used would, would show such a significant uh, sort of, and you know we can presume ongoing increase, right? To some of your earlier statistics. So this is a trend that's unfolding at the, at the moment, which, which, which is your real striking finding. But you know, the question is why, what's, what's driving this? And for me, the puzzle has always been, uh, we've had indications that there are things happening at the top and the bottom of, of the socioeconomic ladder, right? We've, We've got that literature on marriage markets, which I think um, sort of ties in with what Prof Mbato was saying, suggesting that as women gain more education and close the gap between men and education and, and employment, uh, the need for marriage would, uh, would shift. Um, then at the other end, uh, we have evidence, I suppose, largely qualitative, but supported by your data, that some people simply can't afford to get marriage, uh, can't afford to get married, and, there, and there's evidence that the um, bride price uh, and, and Lobola um, play a role in that. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's in that context that your findings on education kind of um, sort of fit into that puzzle. But I was wondering if you have any sort of comment on that, uh, and then relatedly, um, how the South African context might relate to some of those other countries in Africa that you mentioned um, at the beginning of your presentation. We saw that those non-marital fertility rates were really all over the place, um, big differences across countries. And how does South Africa fit into that, I guess, would be my question in your view. Um, can I load you with one more question, Risha? Um, yes. Okay, sorry. This will be the last one for this round. Uh, we've got Prof. Muller online. Um, uh, there we go, Valerie. It looks like you're unmuted. Go ahead. 
Can I say something? Thank you very much, Risha. Uh, fascinating study. Uh, just a small question. Uh, the variables that you didn't mention in your discussion, I just assumed that they didn't, they weren't significant. I was interested in the religion. I'm sorry, I don't know what NIDS, what question NIDS uses. Does it only sort of Christian the various, or if, does it mention traditional indigenous religions as well? Because you mentioned Ebola being a factor. And I thought possibly that people who are Christian plus also acknowledge the ancestors or something, that they might have different views on, on childbearing. Great. Yeah, maybe just walk us through a little bit about some of those other questions. And I think we've probably put enough on your plate for, for this round. So back over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mike. So I think I'm going to address the last question first. Um, so yes, uh, Valerie, you are right. So I spoke on or I discussed the, the findings that were most significant, but also more um, heavily weighted on the economic angle that I'm I I, I was I'm presenting, but with regards to religion, so NIDS asks a whole about a host of religions. So I know that there's definitely a few different categories of African religions which are asked. And then um, you have um, you have a few categories of different types of Christianity um, that are included. And then you have um, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, and um, a lot of the other religions as well. So, in my opinion, it it is um, it is a comprehensive list. Um, if I remember correctly, um, religion was not a significant predictor. But if you would like, I can follow up and just double check on the results um, 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 for you. So, um, yes, I, I hope that answers your question, Valerie. Um, now I'll go to Prof Mbata. Um, so, yes, Prof, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think a lot of current literature focuses on dads and fathers and the presence of fathers um, within a household and also the importance of um, fathers in a household. So there's definitely an entire section um, or an entire, um, you know, body of very much growing literature that focuses on that because there are definitely a lot of questions that are being asked um, about where are the fathers, why are they not involved, or if they are involved, why, they, why are they involved um, in the family and things like that. Um, so I think, and also as Mike did uh, mention that um, with regards to the educational difference point, um, we have this, um, this marriage market concept um, that is, that's taking place in South Africa where we have um, women at the top of the sort of economic bracket who have focused on their career, maybe earning bucket loads of money. Um, so they economically, um, financially stable. And these women um, then have the choice to um, have kids outside of the marriage. And some of them do choose to have kids out, outside of the marriage. The reason for having a child outside of the marriage at that, um, amongst those women um, could be linked to various things, could be linked to just not being able to find a partner. It could be linked to not needing a partner for financial stability um, and a host of other reasons. Whereas, um, and then in addition to that, we have um, women at the bottom end of, um, or at the bottom of this marriage market situation who may be, who may like possibly can't afford to get married. Um, and then who have maybe felt pregnant by mistake or intentionally. Um, so the reasons for also having a child outside of marriage there 
Um, there are quite a few studies that look at that, but um, the point that I wanted to make here is that I have looked at a lot of literature and a, a lot of them are qualitative uh, papers, which um, interviewed a lot of women in South Africa of various ages. And a lot of them claim that they are independent and um, some are financially stable, some are not financially stable, um, but um, at some point they would really, really hope and aspire to get married. So this concept of marriage, you know, and wanting to be married is always there, especially um, or also amongst the older women that I have interviewed for my work as well. Um, so yes, and then um, I looked at um, the time frame 2008 until 2017, um, because those are the five waves of NIDS um, that has been collected. Um, 17, 18. So then they were they were they were a bit slow, I think, to collect the sixth round, and then it was COVID, and now you there's like a whole nid scram um, data set that is being collected. Um, so I'm not sure, Mike, have they collected another round, like a sixth wave? Not as yet. Okay, I thought so. Um, yeah. So so that that was just um, about the time frame. Also, but for my PhD, I looked at data from 2002. So that was using the South African General Household Survey. And um, we saw that there was an increase in, in non-marital fertility from 2002 up until 2017. However, the issue was that um, just motherhood in general was underestimated. So I chose to leave that data set out of this um, paper and out of this presentation. So how does South Africa fit into the larger African context of non-marital fertility? So I think the rate of non-marital fertility within the larger African content in the continent, sorry, is increasing in general. Um, I think we may, we see a lot of the sub-Saharan African countries having similar, similar levels. However, I think South Africa has the highest level um, of non-marital fertility. Um, I think as we move um, towards the northern part of the African context, um, the levels are much lower, although they are increasing. And there's a lot of um, cultural reasons that may be linked to um, the slower pace of increase, if I could say that. So I think I've answered all of the questions. My yeah, question. thanks. Thanks, Risha. Um, uh, yeah, just two quick things. Yeah, there are there there's unlikely to be another round of NITs. So that that is the data we have. And to ask, answer Prof's question, uh, Risha used uh, attrition corrected uh, population weights um, to control yes. for the changing in the in the panel sizes. Um, she used it as cross-sectional data. Um, right, so I think we've got time for one round of questions and I can see one hand in the air and it belongs to Sabiwe and Shlana. Um, Sabiwe. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Dr. Kara. I just had a quick question um, related to the women who are employed, uh, but in low wage jobs. Um, I, like, I'm just wondering what kind of that sample of women, were they already in employment when they had the children um, outside of marriage? Or do you know anything from the data on that? Um, so I definitely do not know. Um, I didn't look into that. So that is another issue with um, this type of analysis. I did not check when exactly the birth took place. Was it before employment or whilst they were in employment? And I'm also not sure if it is possible to check that depending on the employment data that is collected. So Mike's shaking his head. So yeah, I, I don't think it is possible to, to check something. Um, to cross-reference something like that. Yeah, great. That's uh, one of the things this type of survey can't do. 
we uh, they tend to ask questions about what you're doing right now and then when you had a child, but not uh, contemporaneous um, things. Are some possibilities, but we can chat about that some other time. So the the last question today is reserved for someone who is physically here, uh, Risha. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, could, would you mind coming a bit closer to the mic? Yeah, I think you were using laptop mic. Um, a real hybrid event here, you see. <laughs> oh, sorry, um, I don't have much context in terms of the literature surrounding this particular topic, but I was wanting to ask you, you mentioned in the end that um, uh, non-marital children are disadvantaged compared to, you know, a nuclear family or, you know, mother or father figure, et cetera. And we do understand the um, importance of a father figure or, you know, the importance of the dad in the context of the child. But I was wanting to ask you, why is the child disadvantaged? Is it because um, of the, for example, if you get married, then it's a lot difficult to separate and you have more of a, investment into the marriage or is it more of a um, indication of stability what exactly is the what exactly is the advantage or is it just statistically having more employed adults in the household um, for example as an extension yeah. of that question so over to you Risha for that question and any final thoughts you have okay um... So thank you very much for the question. Um, so I think as a sort of disclaimer, I'm going to say that they, they are definitely a lot of children who thrive in single parent households. So it's not a general lack of blanket statement that everyone born to a single parent is just going to have a dismally terrible life and childhood. However, a lot of the literature does point to this and a lot of it um, is linked to the stability that the union of marriage offers. Um, and there's a lot of literature that, um, that looks at this and some of it um, is just that if you are in a marriage, you are less likely to move across different partnerships. Um, and the frequency of those partnerships are also um, reduced. Marriage also provides things like emotional stability for the mom, emotional stability um, for the kids. There's also the additional assistance with childcare. And then as um, Mike has mentioned that there's also just more people working in the household, hopefully. So, um, you're going to have that certain element of financial stability as well. And then um, these factors work with each other to provide a household that caters for the growing developmental needs of children, um, be it be, uh, may it be psychological needs, emotional needs, um, but also physical resources um, and time. Great, thanks, Risha. Um, I just wanted to close with a with a few additional points. Um, the first, I think this was a a really good example of how to exploit a national data resource to to ask and answer interesting questions. Um, I hope if you're interested, you'll reach out to Risha to find out a, a bit more how she used this. But a resource like NIDS can be used creatively like this. Um, to answer all sorts of questions about our society and our labor markets and our and, and the structure of our households. Um, so thanks, Risha, for sharing your, your results there. Um, the second thing I'd like to point out, which Risha didn't mention, is that she did a combined quantitative and qualitative study. So as she has mentioned, this is only one part of, of, of the work that she's done, but I, I'm sure it occurred to most of you while listening that this is a pretty complicated and nuanced topic. So it's, um, you know, the, the combination of quantitative and qualitative is, is probably ideal. And um, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that, that Risha has a lot more to say on this topic and, and also based on the qualitative work she did. Um, so the final thing I'd like to do then is to thank Risha for taking the time to uh, present her work with us. I'm sorry it's taken so long, but 
um, at least you are presenting in a pandemic, relatively pandemic free uh, audience and we were even able to have people in the room. So thanks, thanks very much for, for presenting here. Uh, thanks to the audience members, um, your ISAR colleagues, and as always, thanks to FES for the support in, in this labor study seminar series, as well as in um, the other activities that, that they support. Um, great, so look out for announcements uh, for the next webinar seminar. I think we're going to continue to do these hybrid events um, for the time being, and I hope that some of you will, um, will join us for the next one. Keep a lookout for, for notifications. So thanks everyone and thank you again, Dr. Kara. Huge round of applause from all of us here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, and everyone that tuned in and pitched up um, in person. You know, I really appreciate the offer of presenting and and thank you. I, I, I hope it was well received. Thanks so much. <laughs>